couple of years ago, I was in the outpatient department of a hospital for a screening exam. And every person that came into contact with me would ask at the beginning for my name and my date of birth. I'm sure for anybody listening, this is completely unremarkable. In fact, it's good, solid practice for healthcare providers. But in that moment, I experienced it differently. So here I am working in healthcare accreditation. So intellectually, I was fully aware of why these questions were being asked. But after the third or fourth encounter, my emotional response took over and I began to feel a little bit anxious. I started to question whether this was really a patient safety measure or whether nobody here knew who I was and why I was there. Today on Beyond the Standard, we'll talk about communications, about shared decision making, and maybe even find out a little bit about joy in the healthcare workforce. Beyond the Standard is produced by Accreditation Commission for Healthcare. ACHC supports quality improvement and patient safety by offering education and accreditation services that span the continuum of care. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the speakers and do not necessarily represent official policy or positions of the company or companies with which the participants are affiliated. I am joined today by Dr. Alice Bonner of the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, where she serves as Senior Advisor for Aging. Dr. Bonner has had a distinguished career as a nurse practitioner, focusing on supporting older adults and public health. She's been both a clinician and a policymaker, serving from 2011 to 2013 as Director of the Division of Nursing Homes for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and from 2015 to 2019 as Secretary of the Executive Office for Elder Affairs of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, Dr. Bonner, thank you so much for talking with me today. You are very welcome. And uh, please call me Alice, that'll be great. And uh, just welcome to everyone who's listening today. And I wanna say thank you uh, to all of you for everything that you do every day in your work and your personal lives to support you know, the health and well-being of all of us in communities. We, uh, we really appreciate it. Thanks. So what we wanted to talk about today is a program or maybe it's uh, safe to call it a movement that's named for the central question it addresses, and that is, what matters to you? So I want to start with um, how this concept was developed and how it's been disseminated. I know that that you are um, well versed in its very rich history. Um, I became acquainted with it through um, a seminal paper that came out in 2012 in the New England Journal of Medicine, an article by Dr. Michael Berry and Susan Edgman Leviton. And the concept there was to create um, better patient outcomes by developing deeper relationships between providers and patients and patient families by really understanding what mattered to the patients. Mm -hmm. um, but, but what's the difference between what matters to you and what's the matter with you? So that's so well articulated. And, you know, you bring up in your description uh, very much where this movement uh, came from and how we brought together people who were really uh, interested in a lot of the same things. And it came out of patients or, you know, nursing home residents or family members and care partners who felt that the health system was sometimes just too separate from what really is the most important thing in someone's life? What's their priority? What do they care about the most? And and when you go into a health system and, you know, a lot of us, I'll, I'll use myself as an example, I've been in the health system and all of a sudden, sometimes it feels, if it's not done well, it, it can feel impersonal and nobody asks you that central question of like, you know, what really does matter to you in your life. Um, and, and saying what's the matter with you is more like a, a diagnosis or a medical question. And that's not where we should be starting these conversations. So, you know, there was feedback from a lot of people who've been through healthcare, either in hospitals, nursing homes, assisted living, home health. And across those settings, there was this common theme that people felt, you know, disconnected or isolated, and they didn't feel that that healthcare professionals were really listening to what was important to them. 
And so uh, people such as the, you know, co-authors of the article that you mentioned have built on many years of advocacy and people saying, we can do this better. You know, we can bring together what people do in the community. And, you know, that's a lot of our aging and social service organizations, community-based organizations, everything from a senior center for older people to uh, some of the programs for uh, much younger people and children. And across all age groups, this question of what matters is so central. And it can be part of other movements like the age-friendly health systems movement, which you and I have chatted about a bit. And so it can be not only stand on its own, which I think it does very well, but it also can be built into how we deliver healthcare in a way that makes it more connected for all of us with public health and communities and our, our lives and our well-being. So did that answer your question? <laughs> it, it did. And I think it's really important because when we are engaging with the healthcare system as patients, um, we're really in a very vulnerable place. And that vulnerability can correlate with anxiety um, because of that sense of loss of control. And so um, maybe you can speak to your personal experience using this, this question, what matters to you? Um, how does it impact a patient's sense of personal agency? Great question. So I'm, I'm a nurse practitioner by professional training. And so I've worked with you know, adults and family care partners and um, other and lots of nurses and physicians and social workers over the years. But, you know, it, it really doesn't hit home until you're a patient. And so I was a patient about two and a half years ago for about three weeks in a rehab setting and uh, absolutely wonderful, phenomenal staff, great care, all of those things. But the vulnerability part was I was not allowed to get out of bed by myself because I had had a head injury. And so, you know, I had to, I had to put up, you know, push the button and then I had to wait. And it was a very busy place, very busy. And so sometimes I had to wait so long if I needed to use the bathroom or something, I just couldn't wait anymore. So I got up on my own and of course the alarms would go off and then lots of people would rush into the room. So you can imagine, you know, there I was and, you know, nine different people rush in and they all yelled at me for getting up on my own. <laughs> so Because I you should have known better. <laughs> that's right. You're a nurse. You should know better. Um, but that was an example to me of what you, what you just said. I did feel vulnerable. I felt like I was dependent on people to come in a timely manner and yet I wanted to get up and do it on my own. And so that, you know, lots of people have similar stories who are listening, I'm sure. Um, and there's things about, you know, eating and, and sharing a meal or choosing choosing the foods you wanna eat. Um, that's a big deal if you live in a nursing home or assisted living and, you know, meal time is important and there's socialization and other things, but you can feel very vulnerable if, you know, there's just a tray put in front of you with a certain, you know, set of foods, and that's what, you know, you're expected to, to want to eat that day. So I think the vulnerability is yeah. something that has been more recognized recently than it was in the past. I think in the old days, again, so you're talking to somebody who went to nursing school 40 years ago, but, you know, we were taught more about when people come into the hospital, you know, like, we're in charge, we're the nurses, we're in charge of making sure things go certain ways and people get to their appointments and so forth, their schedule. So I do think it's different now because we want to start with what you articulated so well, what matters to this person? How can we find out? How can we learn enough about them that we really appreciate what's important in their lives and what they want to get out of this episode of care? Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioning that that you were trained a number of decades ago kind of um, brought to mind for me that um, my mom is also a nurse and she often talked about how when she went through training, there was a lot of focus on providing tender, loving care and that at, over the decades of her practice, um, healthcare got better but it got more complex and there was less and less time for that kind mm -hmm. of of personal care 
Um, and uh, my organization has done some work with Dr. Jean Watson, um, and we're very interested in caring science and how, you know, for the for the providers to be fully present in themselves helps the patients as well. And, and so I'm wondering if we're not looking at a cycle that um, maybe healthcare at one point was very patient centered, and then there was a shift away from that. And now we're seeing the pendulum swing back um, mm -hmm. toward more patient centered care. Yeah. Do you think that's I, the case? Yeah, so I think there's two, um, you know, two potential drivers. And if we kept talking, we could probably think of 10 or 20. But, you know, I think one of the things that we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, you know, in 2020 in particular, was, you know, lots more telehealth <coughs> visits. And so people had less human interaction during those telehealth visits. A lot of people liked the telehealth visits. It was easy access and, you know, pretty quick that they could, you know, get care and so forth. But for some people, losing that human connection, I think, was um, was was a big deal. And we also see um, a significant reduction in the number of individuals who use a primary care team or practice now. A lot more people getting their care through urgent care centers, which again, for certain things, very appropriate, of course, but for that ongoing connection with another human being who gets to know you and really understands you and, you know, can follow along every, all the different aspects of your care, medications, therapies, et cetera. I think there's something to be said for having lost that human, you know, connection, as you said. So I think the rise in technology and technological interventions versus human interventions and the other thing is just less time. So an office visit that used to be 30 minutes might now be 20 or even 15 minutes. And again, I work largely with older people, but for any of us at any age, you know, 15 or 20 minutes, that goes by in a heartbeat. And, you know, then you're, you're on your way. And so it's really hard to really get all the information that you need to understand how to best uh, approach a uh, plan of care for somebody in a short period of time. So some organizations are looking for extending time, certainly for individuals who have chronic conditions that require more time to get dressed, undressed, um, to just process information, things like that. But I think your point is well taken, and there are groups that are looking at sort of modern medicine or healthcare, modern nursing, modern social work, and trying to figure out how can we make this better? It's interesting that you mentioned telehealth. We did we did a, an episode recently on mm -hmm. telehealth, and um, I was speaking with a, a chief information officer from one of the hospitals that we accredit, and he was talking about their digital strategy and how um, COVID had really accelerated that that drive into telehealth. It's almost like it it awakened this sleeping giant. Mm -hmm. um, but we talked about how um, providers have to develop um, what he called website manner. Um, and I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. But to go back to, you know, th this idea of what matters to you, I what I'm hearing you say is that even in a, um, a technology driven encounter, that's still essential mm -hmm. to making the connection. Right. I would say it's even more essential because you're not right there and you can't, you know, interact with the person in that physical way um, that, you know, in any office visit, if you <clears throat> imagine the office visits you've had throughout your life, you know, someone touches you on the shoulder or, you know, gives you a pat on the back or something. And there's something to be said for that human interaction. And you just don't get it the same way, um, you know, through the computer. And as I said earlier, if it's not a provider you've ever even seen before and you don't have this, you know, pre-existing relationship, it's, I think it's harder to build that relationship through telehealth. You know, you can do it over time, but that first visit does have those challenges. So I agree with you. I think setting, you know, the stage by asking that question about what matters to you, tell me what are the priorities in your life? You know, are you someone who, you know, loves music? You love opera? Do you love baseball or football? Do you love to cook? Do you love to travel? I mean, these are all kind of pastimes outside of work, but 
for some people, it's really a super important part of their lives. And, you know, if you don't ask the question, you don't find out that maybe they've not been able to perform or engage in musical activities, but they would love to do that again. So again, that's the kind of question that if it's a person directed or person centered approach, that's where you want to start. And then that might lead you to, oh, well, you know, they used to do dance, but now they can't because they have an old ankle fracture and they still have pain in their ankle. So then, you know, that might go to a physical therapist or somebody who can really help with that. So I think it's a great point you're making. And, you know, there are organizations, you probably know, um, you know, even more of them than I do, but there's national organizations that are trying to get the what matters question into all of the work that we do across settings. So I work for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and IHI, and the Conversation Project is one of these national efforts that's you know part of IHI and it's been disseminated pretty widely. We also have CAPSI, um, the Center for Advanced and Palliative Care, um, that's out of New York. They're national. They do a lot of this work on advanced care planning and what matters. And Ariadne Labs, which is here also in Massachusetts, uh, does a lot of national work on training healthcare professionals how to have these conversations. And then again, you probably have others you would add um, to that list, but it, it is a national movement and it's really growing. And I think it's so important that people like you, you know, shine a light on this through, through this program and that all of us feel like we're advocates for this because, you know, nobody's going to take this up unless we do. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's up to us to say, wait a second, I'm a nurse. I, I went into this work because I wanted to work with individuals who needed care and support and building their independence. And asking what matters is one of the most important, if not the most important thing that I can do. That's great. Well, you, you teed up my next question perfectly because I was going to ask you about the conversation project. Um, we are going to include um, some links to information about that in the show notes for this episode. But can you, um, because the conversation project sort of sits within IHI, can you speak to the relationship between what matters to you and the conversation project? So the conversation project, um, and I'll give my best description, and I'm glad you're putting in links because that'll be helpful. It's led by a colleague of mine, Kate DeBartolo. And Kate DeBartolo is really um, knowledgeable and has done work all over the country and actually internationally on this. And it's, it's to guide healthcare professionals and other people, family members, care partners, uh, any of us, friends, neighbors, in how to have conversations about serious illness and advanced care planning. And so again, the way we start is to start with asking what matters. And that's that's really the biggest connection there, I think, is if you're gonna have a conversation with somebody and you're a healthcare professional or anyone important in that person's life, you wanna start by asking that question about what matters. And then the, the reason that we like the conversation project um, is is that the guide to how to have the conversation is written out in a nice pragmatic step-by-step -step kind of format. And so anybody can really pick it up and use it. And that was part of the design. And there were a lot of focus groups and uh, a lot of background research to try to design it in a way that people were not gonna you know, put it on a bookshelf, but they were actually gonna use it in their practice every day or mm -hmm. whenever it was relevant. So um, the other thing they've done is they've updated the manual um, for special populations. So for example, individuals who are living with dementia or some related, you know, uh, disorder, you know, there's a special conversation guide just for those people, because a lot of them have a healthcare proxy or someone in their, in their family who's designated to make decisions on their behalf when they're no longer able to understand risks and benefits. So that's just kind of a, a sub part of the, the project. But I, I think the, the focus is really to say, and this is true with Ariadne Labs and their work as well. The focus is to say, we don't teach this well enough in medical schools yet. And we don't teach it well enough in nursing schools yet. And in population health and public health programs. Some schools do better than others, but there's a big opportunity here. And so 
that's part of where the conversation project comes in. And, you know, um, there were people who were uh, journalists who've been very involved from the beginning in spreading the word and getting it out through media channels, whether it be newspapers or social media. Um, and, and that's part of this is raising awareness and getting people to think about it. So so what would you add to that? Because I know you've done research well, on the conversation project, too. One of the things that I liked when I was um, looking at the materials for the conversation project was the, the recommendation that it's not a conversation, it's a series of conversations. Mm -hmm. And some of these are, are difficult topics to wrestle with, and they mm -hmm. may in fact be things that um, the person being asked doesn't have an immediate answer for because they've pushed off thinking about it. Um, and so you introduce these ideas and um, and you perhaps have a series of conversations. And I thought that was a, a really important idea. It, it, and it ties back to what matters to you in that it, this isn't one and done. It's not, you know, we ask this once, we write down the answer, we move forward with that. Um, people grow and change and evolve and um, the answer may change over time. So absolutely that, that that's a super good you know point that you're making and um, and again that's one of those things that that you're not taught necessarily in your you know health professionals program. So to have that really uh, brought out as an important aspect of this and you know, your point at the end about how people might change their mind, like that's really important because if you've never been in a particular situation, you may not have thought about it and you may not have had an idea. And then when you're in the situation, it changes how you think about it. So, so much of healthcare quality is dependent on metrics. And I'm wondering if there are ways to measure the impact mm -hmm. of these programs. Yeah. Um, great question. And uh, you're absolutely right, because if we want organizations like insurance companies or health plans uh, or government agencies that, you know, pay for, for programs and services, if we want them to cover some of these things, there has to be evidence. So, you know, we need to develop the evaluation strategies for things like what asking the what matters question you know, you can start with very basic documentation. So if I'm running a hospital and I'm the chief nursing officer or chief medical officer, um, you know, I might ask everybody on the team who's responsible to document that they had a conversation, what the person's response was, the patient's, and then what, what goes into the care plan to try to act on what the person is looking for. And then you can measure of the number of people who come into the hospital. You know, if uh, if you wanna get as close to 100% of those people as possible, then you're gonna measure of all the people who came in, what percentage actually had what matters documentation appropriately in their records. And then, you know, you track it over time. So you look over the months and you try to see an improvement or a stability in the percentage over time and get as close to 100% as you can. And, you know, that really also lets you look at differences from one community, uh, one, one floor or unit in the hospital or the nursing home to another. So again, you know, this unit has 80% and this unit over here has 98%. Well, you know, why is it different and how can you sort of get it improving, raising all boats as it were? Um, so I do think the evaluation is important. And then again, that act on component is so critical in a care plan or an action plan for each person. You know, you want to know whether or not the staff was actually able to implement what was suggested, right? So maybe it looks great on paper and it's outlined really well in the chart, but did this, was the staff able to really implement those things? And that's where a quality officer, chief quality officer, for example, or other uh, person on the team can really help to look at those aspects of the work. It's really about the implementation or implementation science. I, I love that you spoke about um, taking action because this is, you know, we, we're a standards creating organization and very often we find deficiencies in, in quality programs and it's often tied to the fact that um, organizations are very, very good at collecting data, but 
um, sometimes then struggle with what to do with that data. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and without taking action, there really wasn't a lot of point in collecting it in the first place. Mm -hmm. The other issue, and, and you raised that too, when you talk about the difference between one department and another is, you know, so you've collected this data and you see that you're at 90%. How do you know that's good? Or, or not, mm -hmm. um, you know, you really need to be able to establish some kind of, of benchmark um, and mm -hmm. and set goals against that. So right. um, that's, this has all been really, really interesting and great information. If every provider listening took away one actionable idea from this conversation, what would you want it to be? I, well, I would say to any provider organization or individual out there, um, you know, what would it take for you to move forward and ensure that, you know, as close to 100% of your, of the people you serve as possible are getting asked what matters to them on every encounter, every visit, um, whether you're a hospital, an ambulatory care practice, a nursing home, a home health agency. It goes across every setting where we practice. So um, I would love if people would take away from today the notion that anyone can do this, any organization can do this. It's not actually a huge heavy lift. And that's one of the beauties of it is it has such a positive impact on care and support. And yet it can be done relatively simply and you can start and there's no you know you don't have to like get it done next week but if you start and build a team and kind of frame out an outline for how you're going to get to again as many patients and residents as possible i think that would be my my goal for today is that you know as close to 100 percent of this audience will go back to their practice settings and their organizations and say are we doing this already? Because a lot of you are. If not, how could we get there? What, what would it take? What would we need to get there? Um, and it's it's not a big, it's also not expensive to do it. I mean, you're going to do it with existing staff. You're not going to do it just to collect the data because that would be just increasing burden on people who have lots of data to collect already. Right. So, you know, again, you would, you would do it because you can act on it and really um, move it forward. So, you know, I'm Pleased, as you know, um, you know you can put my email address uh, on the uh, on the slides or the podcast for today. I'm happy to follow up with folks um, and uh, refer anybody to Kate DeBartolo and the Conversation Project or any of the other you know organizations that we talked about today. I think this is really important work, and we we all need to be in this together. This isn't you know, about any single organization doing it. It's really about collective voice and advocacy on everyone's part. Well, Dr. Alice Bonner, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Um, I think that this has been an exciting conversation. I think people will will come away um, feeling energized. And I, I know there's been discussion about how it ties to joy and work for healthcare providers. Mm -hmm. And after, you know, the last year, 18 months that people have been through, mm -hmm. there's been so much stress, so much anxiety, having something that really makes you feel connected to other people in a joyful way. Um, I think is a is a, a beautiful thing for us to look forward to. So thank you again for your time. Beyond the Standard is a production of Accreditation Commission for Healthcare, providers of accreditation services for a wide range of community-based healthcare providers, including home health, pharmacy, demipose, home infusion therapy, behavioral health, palliative care, hospice, and renal dialysis, as well as hospitals, laboratories, and ambulatory surgery centers. Each episode of Beyond the Standard takes a look at an impactful idea for healthcare provider organizations. We're especially interested in those that help organizations improve as they seek to meet the needs of their communities and the patients that depend on them. ACHC is by providers for providers. Before you go, share your feedback by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts and check out our schedule so you don't miss upcoming episodes. For more information about ACHC accreditation, visit achc.org. While you're there, you can subscribe to this podcast and sign up for our newsletters.